Hi there, folks. I'm Captain JLS. This is a Goose Island IPA. It tastes like grapefruits, and I like it. And this is the first installment of a new series I'm doing on the channel called Turbo Saga 2020 AD, a look back at the games of the TurboGrafx-16 Entertainment Super System and its Japanese counterpart, the PC Engine. <laughs> Now you might be wondering, why talk about the TurboGrafx-16 in 2020? Why talk about the TurboGrafx-16 at all? What is the TurboGrafx-16? Well, the TurboGrafx-16 uh, originally released in Japan in 1987 as the PC Engine was a joint venture of Japanese electronics giant NEC and uh, prolific video game publisher Hudson Soft, who are probably best known today as the guys who gave us Bomberman. They got together to try and create a Famicom killer, uh, a system that could go up against and clobber Nintendo's original video game system, the system we know over here as the NES. And it did quite well at that in Japan in 1987. Then, to bring it over here, they redesigned the console heavily, renamed it, and that took about two years. And by the time they got it to market in the U.S. in 1989, Sega had the Sega Genesis ready to go. And the Sega Genesis kicked the TurboGrafx ass. So, the Nintendo, of course, also still going strong in 1989. Uh, the Super Nintendo came out, I want to say like a couple of years later. And, you know, it picked up right where the NES left off. And so the Turbo Graphics wound up a dismal third to the Nintendo and the Genesis, and then the SNES comes out and just keeps lagging behind in the U.S. market. Um, they tried to remarket it uh, with a new version, the Turbo Duo, in 1992. Uh, NEC was selling the system over here they created another separate company, TTI, them along with Hudson to try and really push the duo over here. That company got dissolved by 1994. <clears throat> there was just no hope for them by that point. So, I mean, that's sort of your history of the Turbo Graphics in America right there. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are some people who were diehards for that system and, you know, kept the torch alive. But uh, for most people, you know, it's a footnote in video game history. So Hudson Soft gets dissolved in uh, 2012. Now, they continued on as a video game publisher for years and years after, but they get dissolved in 2012 and absorbed into Konami. Konami announced last summer that they would be doing a TurboGrafx-16 Mini. Uh, one of these mini consoles. We've had the Nintendo one, we've had the Super Nintendo one, we've had the Sega Genesis one, we have the PlayStation one. Now we're getting the TurboGrafx one. Uh, it is being distributed exclusively through Amazon, uh, which makes sense. Uh, given the history I just gave you, you know, consider the difficulty uh, they would have in getting Walmart to buy it, getting Target to buy it, getting Best Buy to buy it. Um, it comes out this month, and so, in prep for that, uh, I'm going to be doing two episodes here, which focus entirely on the games that are going to be on the mini. This uh, first one we're going to be covering, I think, 26 games, uh, which will take us through about, um, I think, uh, October 1990. The weird thing about the Minis lineup is it's supposed to be sort of evenly distributed uh, Japanese games, American games, but like some of the games are games that came out in the U.S. that you only get the Japanese version of. Uh, I think they did really try with those games to do ones that you can play just fine uh, without reading any of the text. 
because you also have a lot of games where you get both the Japanese and English version. I'll be bringing that up. So as far as what you're about to see, uh, you will be seeing uh, gameplay taken right off of this bad boy right here. Whoa! There went my system card. <laughs> this is my TurboGrafx-16. Um, this unit right here I've had since 1990. The CD-ROM I got in 1991. I can't remember if that was a birthday present or a Christmas present. I'm leaning towards Christmas present. This actually isn't the original drive. Uh, this was replaced by the fine folks at TurboZone Direct. That was a mail order company that was set up to handle the uh, Turbo Graphics and Turbo Duo after TTI was dissolved. And so I think I got this replaced, it was sometime in the late 90s. Um, and th then this thing failed, actually. Uh, now that I think about it, the, the drive then failed a few years ago and I had to get some guy on eBay to you know, replace a, a cog in the drive mechanism. <laughs> but uh, yeah, everything that you see footage-wise is captured off of this device here. Um, no emulation. Um, don't have a setup set up for that. Uh, so any game that I don't personally own, you'll be seeing screen grabs I ganked off the internet or uh, magazine scans that I personally did off of my copies of uh, Turbo Play Magazine and a couple of Turbo Graphics catalogs that TTI mailed out in 1992 or 1993. So that's what you're going to be looking at. Uh, let's go right ahead and let's get into our first game. The Kung Fu, known in the US as China Warrior, that's the version you're watching right now, though the one on the mini is the Japanese version, was a sort of tech demo slash mission statement for the PC Engine, listed on the box as Hudson's first release to the console, though it actually was the third release coming out a month after launch. Bear in mind, when this was out, the PC Engine's competition was the Nintendo Famicom and Sega's SG-1000, the Master System, so this looked like cutting-edge stuff with detailed characters as large as the screen. It was more impressive than some arcade games at the time. Gameplay, though, is a bit on the weak side. It's an auto-scrolling brawler where your Bruce Lee lookalike spends the stage avoiding and hitting obstacles, kicking hordes of oncoming monks and recharging his health in hopes of reaching the stage boss. At that point, the game becomes a rudimentary one-on-one -on -one brawler, which at least controls a bit better than the same year's original Street Fighter from Capcom. Most of the game is pattern memorization, recalling what to do with each round of fans, small logs, snakes, rolling bowlers, etc. It's an okay time waster, but nothing you'll spend a whole lot of time on. Nice touch, though, with the wounds that show up when not Bruce Lee gets beat up. Joseken Necromancer was the very first role-playing game for the PC Engine. Unfortunately, it wasn't released for the Turbo Graphics, so no gameplay footage here. On the Mini, it's going to be presented in Japanese, so you're probably not going to want to play it there, at least on the system out of the box. I'm pretty sure an English translation is available on the wilds of the internet. Whether you're actually going to want to play it at all depends on your tolerance for classic 8-bit RPG gameplay. It looks a bit fantasy star, except with a gruesome medieval vibe. I love the creepy title screen. And uh, it does feature the more menu-heavy gameplay of an early Dragon Quest game. Dig the gnarly monster designs. Goofy Dragon Quest creatures, these are not... Galaga 88, released two years later for the Turbo Graphics, is Galaga 90, again the version you're looking at here, is the fourth installment of Namco's Galaxian series, and the last that isn't a nostalgia-driven remake or a theme park attraction. Yes, you heard me. Go look it up. Galaga 88 takes the basic setup of Galaga, a single-screen shooter where the goal is to wipe out the whole wave of bug-shaped aliens, and adds an additional power form for the ship, yes, now the tractor beam can pull in the dual fighter, and dimension-hopping branching paths that reveal new alien designs and different endings. I really like this game, and it's an easy one to kill a whole afternoon with. Not what I'd call a system seller, but a worthy entry in the minis library. The 
The PC Engine was home to several Sega arcade ports, and the first we're encountering in the Turbo Minis library is Fantasy Zone, a curious pastel-colored horizontal shooter that I've always had a soft spot for. I'm trying to remember if this was the game we bought instead of the god-awful fish shooter Deep Blue, or if that was when we bought Cybercore. Anyway, the gameplay is simple. In each stage, you'll need to destroy all the enemy bases. There's a radar at the bottom of the screen alerting you to how many you have left to destroy. Destroying them and other specific foes nets you money you can use to buy power-up engines and weapons. Destroy all the bases, and you face a stage boss. The designs throughout are charming and imaginative, the music is bouncy, but the game does get pretty rough towards the end. As a side note, you may recognize the player ship, Opa Opa, as the mascot critter in Tatsunoko's 1987 anime, Zillion. He turned up over there as part of the Sega partnership on that show. Apare Gateball is one of two video games in the history of the medium devoted to a Japanese team sports variant of croquet developed in the 1940s. Obviously never released on the TurboGrafx, untranslated on the Mini, you probably won't be spending a lot of time on this one. Let's move on. Nectaris, retitled Military Madness for the Turbo Graphics, is the first game we're encountering that appears in both Japanese and English on all variants of the Mini worldwide. And for good reason, it's extremely text-heavy and is also well worth playing no matter what language you read. It's a simple pick-up-and-play one- or two-player military strategy game. The valiant allied forces are pitted against the Dread Axis Empire. No, they sure aren't being subtle. For control of the moon and a nuclear weapon the Axis have pointed at the Earth. Maneuver your tanks, soldiers, fighters, and transports to outflank and overpower the enemy. Winning is a matter of either destroying all enemy units or taking over their base with one of your ground troops. Both sides also start some maps with craft housed in repair facilities. Ground troops can also take those and claim all the units within. It's funny, I'd heard that this was an all-time TurboGrafx great for years, but I actually first played this when the port for the original Sony PlayStation was released in the States in the 1990s. It's been ported and remade a few times since then as well for the iPhone and the PS3, Xbox 360, and Wii. The copy you're watching me play right now I probably grabbed on eBay about 10 years ago, and as will be a theme here, I don't regret it. Dungeon Explorer is another game that's in both Japanese and English on the PC Engine and TurboGrafx Minis. This Atlas-developed game was a year one TurboGrafx release, and does feature a lot of text, but the core gameplay doesn't require much in the way of translation. It's a gauntlet clone, with villages and role-playing stats thrown in for a touch of additional console game complexity. Just like Atari's classic arcade game, you choose from one of several character classes, Dungeon Explorer has twice as many options as Gauntlet, and bring along some friends with the use of the TurboTap accessory and a handful of additional controllers. As many as five players total, one more than the Gauntlet cabinet would allow. And then, descend into dungeons, fire weapons at monsters, destroy monster generators, and use magic to cause serious damage to the teeming hordes. Unlike Gauntlet, there are also boss fights. There's no experience system, but characters are leveled up, and mercifully healed, after each boss fight. There is a plot about a magic stone you're trying to reach before an evil overlord seizes it, and as I recall, there's an end of game twist that's kinda neat. It's a fun game, but brutally hard when played solo. If you want to give this one a go, buy more controllers, and invite over some friends. This also got a Super CD sequel in the early 90s, and that one did get released in the US, though like most Turbo games from 1993 onward, Dungeon Explorer 2 costs a pretty penny on the secondary market these days. Naxat Soft and Compile's Alien Crash is one of the games you buy a Turbo Graphics for. And yes, it's a pinball game. Specifically, it's a pinball game with an H.R. Giger-inspired aesthetic, with two playing fields, a ton of bonus games, two selectable tunes that complement the mood of the table in different ways, and pitch-perfect predictable ball physics. It's a minor miracle of a game. Personally, I've always preferred Alien Crush to its sequel, Devil's Crush, but you'll find plenty of partisans who prefer the latter. 
Devil's Crush's omission from the Minis lineup is one of the more baffling cases. I suppose it's possible that they thought two pinball games were one too many, but when they're both beloved classics of the platform, you'd think exceptions could be made. One of the TurboGrafx's many weapons in its war of shooter supremacy, Blazing Lasers, originally released in Japan as Gunhead as a tie-in to a 1989 sci-fi flick with a giant robot in it, I expect it's the fact that this strips out the license that got this version on the Mini, is a brilliant shooter by the wizards that compile, with a generous learning curve, tons of awesome weapons, and an exuberant soundtrack. There's really not much to say on this one. If you like vertical spaceship shooters, you'll probably enjoy this. Like Alien Crush, if you don't already have this courtesy of something like the Wii Virtual Console, consider this a reason to buy the TurboGrafx Mini. The first US release I don't own, Victory Run is a typical late 80s arcade style from behind racer based on the Paris Dakar Rally, an annual off-road race which until 2007 ran from Paris across the French countryside and then through African deserts to Dakar, Senegal on the west coast of the continent. The game is all about getting the best time while maintaining the condition of your car, the terrain can tear up your vehicle pretty badly. I considered buying a copy of this for the video, it's pretty cheap as turbo games go, only about 20 bucks on eBay for a complete copy with the jewel case, but I've never been a big driving fan and I figure I'll have it in less than a month anyway if I want to give it a whirl. Yet another game released in both Japanese and English on the mini. This and remarkably its sequel, the unimaginably titled Nootopia 2 about which more later. Newtopia is Hudson Soft doing their take on Nintendo's Legend of Zelda franchise. Because of the shinier graphics of the PC Engine, it winds up feeling like a half step between the original Nintendo Zelda and its Super Nintendo 3 equal, A Link to the Past. And if you like those, you'll feel quite at home here. There's a princess to rescue, and a pile of magic gems to recover as well, and young hero Gisetta has to snag all of the latter to make his way to the big boss Dearth to slay him and rescue the former. Unlike the Zelda games, there isn't a single large world to explore. There are four different realms, with two dungeons each. The dungeons are very, very Zelda, with flip screens and items to recover and secrets to unlock. Also reminiscent of the Zelda games is the horrible sound you'll hear when your health is nearly at its end. I could have done without that one, honestly. I remember getting this as a kid because I had obsessed over the maps for it that were in the very first issue of Turbo Play, the Turbo Graphics magazine published by this, the folks behind my beloved Video Games and PR Entertainment magazine. I still dig it. It's derivative, but it does the trick. Irem's classic horizontal arcade shooter was, as I understand it, a system seller in Japan. Just as the Famicom sold a ton of units because, holy crap, close to arcade perfect Donkey Kong, the PC Engine had a nearly arcade accurate port of this arcade hit. I dig R-Type, though I'm not very good at it. I've never quite given it enough practice to master the use of the force unit that is the R9's signature weapon. Never owned the turbo port. Most of my R-Typing was during a short stretch about 10 years ago where I was toting my PSP everywhere, though I think I played the turbo version emulated around the turn of the century. The US turbo graphics version is the one included on the Mini, presumably because the 1988 PC Engine version was actually released across two Who cards, each sold separately. You'd get a password once you beat the first one to pick up at the start of the second. Japan finally got a single release as a Super CD-ROM years later, but that wouldn't count towards Konami's tally of 25 Turbo Graphics games, and I'm actually fine with skipping that version because I'm not keen on its CD arrangements of the background music. And lo, there comes a mascot. The title of this game, and its hero, PC Genjin, is a pun on the Japanese version of the system's name. Genjin means primitive man, and the character was the lead in a comic strip that featured in a PC Engine magazine early in the system's life. 
The strip was so popular that Hudson, along with designers at Red and Atlas, developed this mascot platformer for the character. Of course, as the pun doesn't work in English for multiple reasons, in the US the cave boy hero became Bonk, and his initial outing Bonk's Adventure. While that is, of course, the version you're watching now, oddly the PC Engine and Turbo Mini will be getting the original Japanese PC Genshin game. The main mechanic, as suggested by the hero's English name, is hitting your dinosaur foes with your giant noggin. This can be done as a forward attack, a dive, or a rapid spin courtesy of the Turbo Controller's standardized auto-fire capabilities. Bash baddies, keep running right, collect power-ups, visit occasional mini-games centered around the game's mechanics, find secrets, and beat brainwashed bosses until they come to their senses. The first bonk is an imaginative, solid example of its genre. Like I said about Newtopia, I'd say this is a step ahead of what was happening on the Nintendo at the time, but not quite to where the 16-bit era would take the mascot platformer in even just a year or two. The sequel would really take things to that next level, and thankfully that's included as well, but we'll be talking about that next time. While my peers who grew up with the Super Nintendo in the house speak in hushed tones about that system's Final Fantasy games and Chrono Trigger, this was my gateway to a greater world. East Book 1 and 2 is an adaptation by Hudson Soft and Alpha System of prolific computer role-playing game publisher Falcom's PC-8801 home computer games. The story is, well, let's just listen. East, the ideal utopia. Once a country so peaceful and prosperous. A country where children were as free as the wind. A country where harmony blew through the hearts of all men. East, a kingdom ruled by the wisdom and charity of its six powerful priests. An empire watched over and blessed by the enchanting aura of its two beautiful goddesses. East, the seemingly tranquil paradise suddenly pulled from the height of its civilization to the empty abyss of infinite isolation. How could such a land of promise simply vanish from the face of the planet? How could such prosperity be forgotten? The legend has been silenced for over 700 years. And now, the mystery unfolds. So Ail Christian, red-haired adventurer, docks at the town of Menea and is immediately met with a fortune teller named Sarah who tells him a bit of the backstory you've just heard. She believes that recovering the six sacred books of the East might just help put a stop to the trouble that's erupting across the continent of Asteria and is certain that young Adel is just the man for the job. East is an action RPG, but unlike Newtopia, you don't swing your sword. Instead, you just rush headlong into the villains but always just offset so that they don't come back at you. It's tricky at first, but on the main field screens, your life recovers automatically, giving you a chance to master the mechanic. Not so much once you enter shrines and dungeons, however. This is the first CD game we've encountered, and you can hear the difference. A great deal of the game's soundtrack is CD audio. Originally composed by Yuzo Koshiro of Streets of Rage fame, but arranged for this version by Ryo Yonamitsu. 
The game also features voice acting at several key moments. Again, both Japanese and English versions are provided on the mini. The English dubbed version actually isn't half bad. The opening narrator is one Alan Oppenheimer, best known today as the voice of Skeletor and Man at Arms in the original He-Man cartoon. Are you here to rescue me? How wonderful it would be to escape these chains. I have been locked up here for too long. My name is Fina. Fina is played by Debbie Derryberry, who is probably best known as the voice of Jimmy Neutron from the 2000s Nickelodeon series of the same name. Michael Bell plays the big villain of East One. You have done well so far. I am impressed by your daring ambition. You might recognize him as the original voice of Red Lion, Pilot Lance, and Voltron, and Duke from G.I. Joe. Dan Gevelzan, Spider-Man on Spider-Man His Amazing Friends, and Bumblebee in the original Transformers turns up in these two. And a young Thomas Hayden Church gets a few lines in both games as the Bandit Gobon, seen but not heard here. For a lot of players, this is still a definitive version of the first two East games. Many further remakes have come and gone in the 30 years since this was released in English, and I've played a few of them. But I always come back here. Certainly, I prefer the late 80s anime aesthetic, but I also like how this links the two games, with Adol's experience points persisting across the two, making it feel like one cohesive experience. And truly, this version of the score can't be beat. I get it if you can't get past the combat mechanic, folks have been complaining about it for decades, and yeah, they did away with it after East 4 for a reason, but if you give the game a fair shot, I'm sure you'll come away with at least an idea of what so enchanted me as a grade schooler. That said, in a world where multiple generations of consoles have had fully voiced anime-flavored RPGs, including ones in this very series, I'm sure it won't have quite the same effect. Sometimes, you did just have to be there. The second and final racer on the mini. I know, it feels early, right? and also the second game you can play with four friends using the TurboTap. It's a top-down racing game with crazy space future cars, scantily clad anime girl presenters, and peppy tunes that get drowned out by the engine noises. Like our previous five-player extravaganza, it looks like multiplayer is the way to go with this one, though I could see myself killing a weekend afternoon with it. This had two sequels, neither of which made it to the US or to the Mini, which is yet another shame. Motorotor 2 in particular looks pretty rad. A perfectly typical 8-bit golf game that I suspect is here because Hudson owns it, and it's an early TurboGrafx release. Genuinely have no idea who'd want to play this in 2020 unless they happened to own it in 1990 and have fond memories. Take Hudson's Wonder Boy clone Adventure Island series. Give the player character a bit more oomph in the style of Mario, and then scatter secrets across the game world, and you have JJ and Jeff, a goofy action platformer with a grin on its face, a spring in its step, and a poor reputation that I can only imagine is due to how weird the characters look, and maybe how often birds poop on the player characters. Originally based on a Japanese comedy variety show starring Cha Kato and Ken Shimura, the same show, incidentally, that was licensed by ABC to create America's Funniest Home Videos, this is the U.S. version with the license stripped out and generic American characters replacing the real-life comedians. I honestly bought this within the last 10 years off of Amazon, of all places, after watching Dr. Sparkle's Cron Turbo episode here on YouTube singing its praises. And, with practice, the early going is not as hard as I'm making it out to be in this video. It's a game that requires careful timing, and the lag of coming through the composite adapter into my laptop is throwing me off and causing the game to kick my ass. The title detectives run, jump, and kick. Pick one and the other creeps around the background and occasionally harasses you. Vitality drops as you run about, again, just like the first Wonder Boy in the Adventure Island games, and you need to replenish it by grabbing fruit. Collect coins to play in the slot machine, and earn lives and extra vitality. Kick everything in sight to find secrets, both bonus and necessary. Not a system seller, and it doesn't look quite as polished as Bonk, but then the original Japanese version came out a full two years before the big noggin caveman hit the PC engine. This one's actually a real joy, and while I was late to the party on it, I'm glad I got here in the end.
Here is our second Namco Arcade port, a curious samurai action game that switches between several different styles of gameplay, two different side-scrolling types, one that reminds me of a Nintendo Ninja game, and one with big clunky sprites, and a top-down action style. The PC Engine-only sequel, which entirely features the big clunky gameplay style, was released in the US as Samurai Ghost in 1992. This one just looks weird and frustrating, but I'll happily give it a fair shake. The second CD-ROM game on the Mini Systems, and it's NEC Avenue's port of Taito's classic arcade game where you fight evil Robofish from space. Pretty cool, honestly, that Konami's packed their Mini full of ports of classic arcade shooters. Of course, a modern port of Darius would get a bit closer to the arcade game's old gimmick, that the playing field is three screens wide, but this still looks like fun. So here we finally reach the reason why I pre-ordered the TurboGrafx Mini off of Amazon all those many months ago. I said to myself, if there are two games on here that I really want to own whose price is more than the TurboGrafx Mini costs, I'm buying the Mini. This is the first of them, Hudson's sequel to their NES shooter Star Soldier. Of course, I couldn't help but notice, despite Compile not being involved in this one, the gameplay and presentation owe a lot to Blazing Lasers. I do wonder why they specifically put the PC Engine version on here, but regardless of version, this was a no-brainer for Konami to put on the system. Here's an important one that a lot of folks have never gotten a chance to play, NEC Avenue's port of Capcom's Ghouls and Ghosts for the Super Graphics. Sony and Microsoft didn't invent the half-step-up console in 2016. No sir, the NEC Super Graphics is a backwards-compatible update to the PC Engine that was released in Japan in December of 1989. Unfortunately for NEC, it was a flop, but they did get five games to market, two of which appear on the TurboGrafx and PC Engine Mini. This version of Ghouls and Ghosts is considered to be the best game for that system, and visually it blows the Genesis version away. The sound might seem a bit off at first, but it's no less faithful to the arcade original than the Genesis version, just different. I could definitely see this selling a lot of minis to 40-year-old gaming nerds who remember seeing pictures of this in magazines. It's another port of a Namco arcade game that's obscure in the United States. Legend of Valkyrie is a colorful action RPG that puts me in the mind of, what if The Legend of Zelda was a mid-80s arcade game? While the core gameplay needs no translation, unless you read Japanese, signs and prompts when you talk to villagers will have you googling for an FAQ when you play. And again with the Namco arcade games that were obscure in the US. At least until this home version hit the turbo in the summer of 1990, which raised its profile a great deal. It was advertised heavily in comic books of the time, with a great two-page comic art ad explaining the story of the game. Spiderhouse is the first game that I can remember with gore as a selling point, and of course it was on my console, so I had to have it, even though I've never been a horror fan. To this day I've never seen any of the Nightmare on Elm Street or the Friday the 13th. But I have beaten Splatterhouse again today as I'm recording this, which raids the iconography of all those 1980s slasher flicks for a single plane side-scrolling brawler where the hero wears an enchanted hockey mask turned red for the US TurboGrafx version to avoid potentially sticky legal trouble. The Japanese mini actually has the Japanese version of the game with the correct mask that gives him the unholy strength to storm the titular house to rescue his kidnapped girlfriend. Gameplay is a little clunky, but fair. Patterns are easy to memorize. Collision detection is good. It might actually be a little too easy, but while that might have been a deterrent as a retro purchase on eBay, or as a virtual console download, in a collection of 50-ish games, that's not the same kind of knock, especially when it's still so satisfying to splat zombies across the wall with a 2x4. Later stages have a non-linearity that keeps things sort of interesting on a second go-around. Two sequels followed in the early 90s, but only on the Sega Genesis for some reason. Namco did try to revive this series on the PS3 a decade ago, and apparently that went... Uh, badly. Ninja Spirit is the very sort of ninja game I was referring to when talking about Genpei Tomaden. I've been trying to fit a copy of it into my budget pretty much since I first wandered into the wilds of eBay like 20 years ago. And 10 years ago I did have it on the TurboGrafx app for iOS on my iPad and I would kill time with it when I was working retail. It's a fantastic arcade action game with multiple weapons and Ninja Shadow Pals of the sort you might remember from Ninja Gaiden 2 and giant bosses and I'll be happy to finally get to play it with a proper turbo controller come mid-March. Originally titled Paranoia in its PC Engine release, Psychosis is a bizarre side-scrolling shooter that, to me, looks like a solid R-Type clone with a unique take on that game's force unit, 
But for Amiga computers, the look of the gradients and the colors remind me of that platform. Betting we got this version because in Paranoia, after you beat each boss, you see a nasty little gremlin giving you the finger and dropping an F-bomb. The high concept is that you're fighting through your mind, clearing away dark thoughts with a sci-fi shooter spaceship. I'll tell you, I was just watching footage of this, and this final boss, I definitely remember this final boss from Game Magazine coverage of the time. It looks like a B-list shooter for the Turbo, but if you're making a representative lineup, the Turbo Library has a lot of B-list shooters, and this doesn't look like a bad one. And finally for today, the NEC Avenue port of Space Harrier, Sega's iconic arcade 3D sprite scaling shooter. My strongest memory of the TurboGrafx version of this game is seeing a copy of it at Video Concepts, the TV and stereo shop that was right next to Camelot Music at North Park Mall, and wondering why it was like 10 bucks more expensive than every other game for the system. Obviously I didn't have this one, the version of Space Harrier I played the most as a kid was the Amiga port, and I was never any good at it. That said, this apparently is the home version folks swore by until the 32X version came out in 1994. So that is just about it for the first episode of Turbo Saga 2020 AD. That is half of the lineup that's going to be on the Turbo Graphics Mini when it drops uh, towards the end of this month. Uh, let me know what you think of the episode in the comments. Um, I am also going to be providing in the comments uh, some of my favorite Turbo Graphics resources on the internet. Um, and yes, that was an awful lot of arcade ports. That was an awful lot of shooters. And there's still a lot more shooters to come. That was one of the big selling points and strengths of the TurboGrafx library. Those are the games that people still pay good money for today. Uh, you'll note the bit I mentioned about uh, Super Star Soldier. A good copy of that costs 125 Wait until you see how much a copy of Soldier Blade, the next uh, Star Soldier game to come out in English, uh, goes for these days. Yeah, that's the other reason I decided to actually shell out for the mini. I am not buying a copy of Soldier Plate. <laughs> that is not happening. That is, um, that's about a month's rent right there. Uh, anyway, so I'm gonna go and switch t-shirts and probably start working on the new episode of this Robotech thing. I'm gonna finish this beer, and I am also, before I get any of that done, uh, well, maybe not the beer, but uh, I'm gonna play me some PlayStation 2 Bonk. This is your pal, Captain JLS, signing off.